So I'll talk about uh, the, what is called the self-tier strings of uh, six-dimensional superconformal field theories and its relations to the instantons of exceptional gauge theories, whose relations I'll try to elaborate during, during my talk. Okay. So the talk is based on a paper that I recently posted on, at, uh, posted on archive uh, in collaboration with Hichal Kim, who's in the audience, and Chemo Park, who's in Korea. It's also partly based on a work in progress in same collaboration, and also with my ex-student, Juno Kim, who's also here. Uh, right after posting a paper, the following two papers, which are closely related to ours, has appeared. So uh, 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 indirectly, I'll also have to mention some, some, of, this, some of the materials covered in this paper. Okay. So <clears throat> six-dimensional superconformal field theories have been studied in quite a, quite detail, uh, have been quite extensively studied uh, during the past uh, few years in various directions. In particular, what I'd like to emphasize today is the constructions uh, or the indirect construction of, the, of a wide class of superconformal field theories using the string theory setting. As, as, as many of you will well know, these six-dimensional quantum field theories are never formulated directly using any Lagrangian formulations, and they are only predicted indirectly in various string theory settings and by taking suitable decoupling limits. Okay? So there are many ways of constructing these field theories uh, by string theory. And one, one easy way is to use some brain settings, D brains and NS5 brains, in virtually the flat space-time background. Okay? Uh, I'll not retreat these cases uh, in, in this talk. I'll mostly discuss the superconformal field theories which are engineered by geometric setting. These are engineered by putting the string theory in a suitably curved background with some singularities. Okay? So, the, so the canonical example is the first kind of discovery of, of six-dimensional superconformal field theory, preserving two-zero supersymmetry, and that's the work by Witten in mid-90s. So to maximal superconformal field theories, which follows the ADE classification, has been found by Witten by putting the type 2b string theory on C2 mod ADE OB4 singularities. And at the, sing at the tip of the singularities, there are some six dimensional light degrees of freedom, uh, which provide the six dimensional quantum field theory degrees of freedom. Okay? And if you are interested in less supersymmetric theories, n equal to 1, 0, minimal superconformal field theory, you have to go to a more complicated setting. You are asked to consider the, the same 2b background on certain four manifold with singularities but with varying axial dilaton, depending on space-time. So this asks you to consider basically the F-theory on R6 times some elliptically fibered Calabiao threefold, which has been discussed earlier in, the, in, in, in this conference. Okay. So the elliptically fibered Calabiao is nothing but take, uh, roughly taking the following structure. So it's a basically type 2b string theory defined on certain curve four manifold. It has a singularity which can be resolved in a particular way. And for, for, for most general uh, setting, the axial dilaton, which is pa pa parameterized by the complex structure of the torus, can change depending on where you are in the space-time. Okay? So the recent finding, the recent discovery of a large class of superconformal field theories in six dimensions is basically done in a geometric way, trying to understand what kind of elliptic Calabiao, uh, non-compact elliptic Calabiao three-folds are possible which gives rise to the physics of six-dimensional superconformal field theories. And doing that means basically, uh, primarily means that what kind of singularities on the four-manifold, four four-dimensional base are allowed, okay? So to classify what kind of singularities are possible, uh, physically, basically, one has to, mathematically, one has to resolve the singularity in various ways and see the result, how, how, the, how the singularity is resolved. Physically, the resolution corresponding to going to what is called the tensor branch of the six-dimensional CFT. So all the kinds of six-dimensional CFTs that are known always have some numbers of tensor multiplet. The tensor multiplet contains a two-form potential <coughs> whose three-form flux is required to satisfy a self-duality condition, and the super multiplet contains some fermions and a real scalar. If you give some expectation value to the scalar, you're going to the tensor branch, something like the Coulomb branch of the gauge theories. So going to the tensor branch corresponds in geometry to making the singularities uh, smooth. And this, and this resolution happens by replacing the singularity by certain numbers of spheres which intersect with each other. 
So the volume of each two sphere is corresponding to the expectation value of the corresponding scalar. So using this kind of picture, these groups of people have been uh, 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 classifying what kind of non-compact elliptic Calabria three folds are possible and found a large class of n equal to one zero superconformal field theories. The structure of the field theories found in this literature goes as follows. Often it's called the atomic classification because it use, uses a finite set of simple superconformal field theories as atomic building blocks. Once you know the atomic building blocks well, you can use it as a building block of a sort of quiver from which you can build a more complicated quantum field theory. Okay? So, so, so what is called the atoms uh, have the following structure. So basically, uh, the important atoms that I'll discuss to you are appearing in the first table. Okay? So all of them have one-dimensional tensor branch, meaning that in the previous picture I've shown you, the, the resolution of the singularity gives rise to you only one two-sphere. So it has one tensor branch. Okay? And the number n labeling all these different theories are nothing but the self-intersection number of the two-sphere corresponding to the tensor multiplet scalar. Okay? So depending on what the values of n are, there can be various symmetries of the six-dimensional theory. Okay? For, so if you have non-trivial gauge symmetry in six dimensions, that appears by wrapping suitable numbers of seven brains on the two-sphere. Because the seven brains on their world volume host suitable gauge symmetries. Okay? Yes, please. Coupled to gravity. Uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, the last one, la the, the second table, I don't know, but the first, all of them in the first table can be made into the. You are in the second table. Uh, uh, the second ones, I'm not sure. I mean, it has been. Uh, I, I have to carefully read this paper. This provided this list, but um, I'm not sure whether they just did non compact one or compact one as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Huh? Monte Mo uh, you, you know the answer. No, I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have to read this paper carefully. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. So apart from these ones, which are sometimes called minimal superconformal field theory in six dimension, there are some exotic atoms which have two or three dimensional tensor branches. These are nothing but having two or three two spheres, which have self-intersection number two, three, two, three, two, 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 three, two, and have relative, uh, mutual intersection number minus one. So it's, to understand the structure of six-dimensional superconformal field theories in any microscopic way, it's most important to understand these atoms first. Once you understand these atoms, the rule of constructing more complicated conformal field theories is somewhat well known, at least in the geometric setting. For instance, you can glue many of these two spheres, or the gauge theories, in the form of quiver, uh, and the rule of forming quiver is also well known. Okay? Uh, it uses a so-called E-string gauge theory, having E8 global symmetry, and it, it provides the role of glue of the forming the quiver. So you have the E8 symmetry, which is very large. So if you want to uh, glue any two gauge theories to form a quiver, you can do so by taking the product gauge group of the two adjacent nodes, and if there is a subgroup, they are the subgroup of E8, you can gauge the part, this part of E8 to make a quiver. So the rule is quite well known. This is one way of making a bigger superconformal field theory, having higher dimensional tensor branches. And the second way of making the, the quantum field theory more non-trivial is by unixing procedure. Basically, you add more hypermultiplet matters. Here, you basically have no matters with which you can Higgs. You have either no matters or half hypermultiplet, which cannot be given expectation value. So the process of unixing is achieved by adding more matters and enlarging the gauge group. So kind of decorating this kind of minimal theories. So by these two ways, you can form a rich class of one zero superconformal field theories. So this is the review of the works on one zero CFTs in the past few years. Now I'll turn to the main object of my interest. So I'll talk about what is called the self-dual strings in six-dimensional CFTs. This is a universal object which is appearing in all kinds of six-dimensional CFTs in the tensor branch. Okay? So let me explain first in string theory how they happen. I explained to you that in the F-theory setting, the tensor branch is obtained by making the singularity resolved by having many finite volume two spheres. Okay? 
And if the D3 brains are wrapping these two spheres, they can form a string-like configuration in six dimension. These are called the self-dual strings. They are called the self-dual strings because these strings, under the two-form potential that I just explained to you, uh, have exactly the same, uh, um, same, same amount of electric and magnetic charges. So since the electric and magnetic charges are the same for this object, uh, it's, called, it's given the name self-dual strings. It, it, it's basic objects, universal objects in six-dimensional field theories, and it's quite analogous to various objects that we have in four-dimensional gauge theories and Coulomb branches. There we have W bosons, monopoles, and dions of all sorts of charges, but everything that has been appearing here in four dimension is analogous to one object, self dual strings in six dimension, because uh, its electric and magnetic charge are the same. Okay? So these self dual strings are half BFPS objects in one zero superconformal field theories, and if you choose this orientation carefully, uh, suitably, uh, it preserves two dimensional 0, 0,4 supersymmetry on its wall sheet. So at low energy, uh, one can find a two dimension, one can expect to have two dimensional n equal to 0, 0,4 superconformal field theories on the wall sheet of these self dual strings. And this superconformal field theory is of my main interest. Um, it, it, there are many motivations for being interested in these theories. Uh, it turns out to be very crucial that uh, object for understanding various interesting observables in uh, 60 CFTs in recent years, like superconformal index and so on. And this object is of interest in its own right. So, so various reasons uh, 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 people have been interested in this self dual string quantum field theories. And since I said that, <coughs> to understand the six dimensional quantum field theories, it is important to understand the atomic constituents, which form a more complicated ones. Also in two dimensions, there will be large class of two-dimensional quantum field theories for self dual strings, and there should be corresponding two-dimensional atoms for the 0, 0,4 quantum field theories. So mainly I'll study this kind of uh, 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 quantum field theory in my talk. Okay. <coughs> uh, one very important dis viewpoint about the self dual strings that I'll keep recalling in my talk is the following. So the self dual strings can be understood in a very simple manner if, you, if we recall an effective quantum field theory description of this CFT in the tensor branch. And that is given when there is a six-dimensional gauge symmetry by a six-dimensional super young mill theory coupled to various hypermultiplet methods and the abelian tensor multiplets. This is, this is the full bosonic part of the action in the simplest case in which we have only one tensor multiplet. So this is the scalar and the three-form kinetic term. Of course, the way you, use, you, way you, use, you should use this put Lagrangian is exactly in the same sense as type 2b supergravity. Since self-duality condition is hard to impose in Lagrangian way, you ignore that, you vary the fields and derive the equation of motion and then impose the self-duality by hand. Okay? So understanding it this way, this is just a kinetic term of tensor multiplet fields and it couples the vector multiplet fields in the following way. Okay? So if the scalars are assuming non-zero expectation value, it sets up an effective Young-Mills theory, Young-Mills coupling scale, so it gives rise to 60 Young-Mills description. And the super partner term of this is coupling the B mu nu field to the, what is called the instant on number density. Okay? So what is charged on the B mu nu is the self dual strings, and in the Young-Mills theory viewpoint, this is provided by the stringy soliton, which carries the instant on number. So self dual strings are instant on string solitons and super young mills. This will be the main, most important viewpoint in, the, in my talk. Any questions so far? Of course, six dimensional conformal field theories are difficult. Two dimensional CFTs are apparently looking easier, but if they are strongly interacting, they are also difficult to study. Okay? So, so these two dimensional 0, 0,4 CFTs uh, can be a bit easy, can be studied in a bit easier, easy, uh, can be studied a bit more easily if one can have a gauge theory sitting in the UV. So the two-dimensional gauge theory is a weakly coupled in UV. So we, you, if one can engineer a UV gauge theory in 2V, which flows to the desired superconformal field theory after RG flow, it will be much more easier to study some observables of this theory. Okay? So it's basically taking advantage of this gauge linear sigma model language, which has been explored by Witten more than 20, 20 years ago. Okay? So these two-dimensional gauge theories, which are not conformal by itself, but expected to float the theory of interest, can be constructed in two major, uh, two different ways. I'll call the top, first way the top-down approach. 
And the top-down approach is applicable when the self-dual string in string theory is admitting a D-brain description. Okay? So, one, so the two, some of the examples of admitting this top-down construction is as follows. So I've listed some of these atomic constituents. Let me consider the case where self-intersection number is two. This is a very well-known example. In this case, the F-theory background can be suitably dualized to the following type, following type 2A configuration. And, and, the, and the six dimensional field theories is nothing but the field theory living on two parallel NS5 brains. Okay? So this is nothing but the SU2 type uh, 2 0 superconformal field theory. And in this setting, the self dual strings are nothing but a stack of D2 brains suspended between the NS5s. Okay? So since this ad admits the uh, D brain realization of the self dual strings, the low energy dynamics on the world sheet of self dual strings is governed by the light open string dynamics suspended between the D brains. Okay? And uh, after the strong coupling or the low energy limit, uh, you take the low energy limit of this quantum field theory, you expect it to get the M2 brain dynamics uh, suspended between M5 brains. Okay? So these strings are given the name M strings. And basically using this setting, with slight deformation to make the technical setting easier, this group of people have found out a two-dimensional quantum field theory description gauge theory description for the M strings. A similar construction has been made for the case N equal to 1. And after you dualize it to type 2A setting as well, it turns out to be the following configuration. It's an NS5 brain probing this following oriented fold 8 plane background where the self dual strings are D2 brains suspended between them. So again, if you take the strong coupling, <coughs> two-dimensional low energy limit, it becomes an M2 brain suspended between the M5 brain and what is called the Hojava with an E8 wall you know, this end of the world wall of this heterotic M theory. So since these strings are probing the E8 symmetry of the hojava written world, this is given the name E strings. And once you have a gauge theory, once you have a brain construction of strings, extracting out the gauge theory living on, its, on the UV of this CFT is very easy, and it has been done in the following work. Okay? But this is very special cases, these are. In most general cases, the F-theory setting has various types of seven brains, of various PQ charges wrapping the two sphere. So dualizing it to other, other setting, you, you're, not, you, you're not always guaranteed to have D-brain constructions. Okay? So this is the more, 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 most complicated setting. In, uh, the, the, this is the complicated situation in F-theory. So to find out the two-dimensional gauge theory, the second useful approach that turns out to be useful for at least for some examples is what, is, what I call the bottom-up approach. And bottom-up approach is obtained by recalling the instant on soliton string viewpoint of the self dual strings in 60 super young males. To elaborate it on it a bit more, recall that uh, the effective action had this kind of interaction. So any kind of strings having F wedge F source will be, the so will be co coupling to this B mu field and should be interpreted as self dual strings. And you take the six-dimensional young males on R6 and take the R4 direction transfers to the strings, and you require the following self-duality equations to be satisfied on R4, either with plus or minus sign. It gives you rise to the self-dual strings or anti-self-dual strings, so I'll choose plus without losing too much generality. So, it, the, so the configuration satisfying this equation have some solutions which are localized on R4, being point-like, so it's a string-like object in sixth dimension. So this is the effective field theory realization of the self-dual strings. The instanton numbers are mapping to the self dual string numbers. Okay. The reason why this viewpoint is useful is the following. So for instantons, there are many, many useful facts known, many mathematical and physical facts. And for instance, if, if the gauge group for the young mills theory is classical, either SU, SO, or SP, a natural candidate for the world volume gauge theory on the instanton has been proposed by the so-called ADHM construction. ADH, uh, if you don't know the ADHM construction, you don't have to worry too much. It was developed originally as a technique to find a solution to this nonlinear equation, but soon after, by string theorists, it has been given a broader context of, of providing a possible gauge theory which are living on the world volume of instanton like solitons. So once there are ADHM like constructions, there are natural starting point of gauge theory uh, which you can try to use to understand this kind of self dual string objects. Okay? So let us go back to the table and see what we can do. 
Unfortunately, most of the gauge groups are exceptional. This is a characteristic uh, feature of F-theory, actually the power of F-theory. But unfortunately, in the, in, the, in, the, in the case where the gauge group is exceptional, this bottom of intuition cannot be applied. Okay? So, so at the, today I won't say too much about it, uh, except in the last few pages. But the remaining two classes seem to be very easy because SU3, SO8, we know the ADHL construction, we know the natural gauge theory, we think we know the natural gauge theory we can start with. So indeed, for the case of SO8, superconformal field theory, the natural ADH construction works perfectly well because the SO8 gauge theory, ADHL construction asks us to consider the following quiver preserving 0,4 supersymmetry. So if you prepare k number of strings, the ADHL construction asks us to consider the SPK two-dimensional gauge theory with SO8 flavor symmetry in 2D. There are some bifundamental hypermultiplier methods and anti-symmetry methods, complicated. So whenever I write down the quiver diagram, please understand it as I have the classical Lagrangian and I know everything about classical physics. Okay? So this case has been studied uh, by this uh, group, uh, Albright and uh, uh, other friend of ours. And this gauge theory can be used to study a, 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 a lot of detail of the quantum physics of these SO8 uh, self dual strings. For instance, this gauge theory could be used to compute the elliptic genus, and, and the physics could be compared with the alternative analysis of these strings using the topological string approach. Okay? So this, this is the perfectly good quantum field theory describing this string. Uh, there's actually a secret reason why this bottom-up approach works, because this also admits the D-brain construction. So the two pictures are completely agreeing well. So it seems that only one class is left where the bottom-up approach can, could possibly apply. So let's study the SU3 case. And the real surprises come here, at least to me, because if you try to apply the naively constructed SU3 ADHM gauge theory, it turns out this is a bad quantum field theory. The reason why it's a bad quantum field theory is the following. Normally in the literature, this ADH and gauge theory has been used in zero or one dimensional context to study the instanton dynamics of four or five dimensional gauge theories. It's perfectly fine. But as soon as you uplift it to two dimensional gauge theories, you have to suffer from the gauge anomalies on the world sheet. If you prepare K instantons, the gauge group is UK classically, but this theory is intrinsically a chiral theory, preserving 0,4 supersymmetry and so on. And it turns out that this naive quiver is wrong by having gauge anomaly. You compute both U1 and SUK anomaly. It's anom uh, I think I computed here the SUK part of the anomaly, and this is non-zero. So from the vector multiplet, there can appear some Fermi, uh, Fermi multiplet, which contributes to negatively to the one-loop anomaly. Uh, the chiral multiplets have fermions, right-moving fermions, which contribute positively to the anomaly, so their contribution don't cancel to zero. Okay? So this is a bad quantum field theory. And having seen a faili failure, it's natural to explain why the failure is natural. Because, because this SU3 is not really engineered by having 3D3 brains, uh, 3D brains. So this ADHM construction is naturally motivated when the SU3 is realized on the stack of 3D brains. 3D7 brains, 3D5 brains of any sort. But if you carefully see how F-theory realized this SU3, it is realized in a very subtle non-perturbative way. So this is realized by the so-called H2 singularity of this inter, uh, H2 singularity of the D7 brain uh, of the seven brain configuration, and this SU3 symmetry is realized not by having three D7 brains, but having two. Uh, but in a suitable SL2Z frame, it is prepared by having first two D7 brains and two S dual brains. So the S dual of the D7 brains. So of course there could be light, actually massless fundamental strings suspended between two D7s, giving rise to SU2, but the way it enhances to SU3 is highly non-perturbative. Namely, the other W bosons or the, or, the, or the root states of SU3 are given by having D strings or the non-trivial PQ junctions all being massless, suspended between various mutually non-local seven brains. So the way this SU3 is formed is highly uh, non-perturbative, or well, in a way I should say it's exceptional, like the other exceptional gauge group realized in F-theory. Okay? So this is the reason for this failure. Okay? So what can you do in this, uh, after we encounter this failure? Before explaining this, let me summarize the situation. So for the case with SO8, 
it's really a classical gauge group, and it, the ADHM construction of self dr 3 gauge theory works well. And the other cases, including the apparently classical gauge theory, SU3, should be regarded as F-theory as a non-perturbative gauge, as sorry, the, the, the exceptional gauge theory, in which the naive ADHM construction is not working. It's important to study this SU3 theory in some details, because in the recent construction of six-dimensional CFTs, this atom is playing a fairly important role is to, to, to construct all kinds of novel new uh, six-dimensional CFTs. In particular, the, all these exotic, all these kind of exotic atoms essentially uses this atom 3 in the version in which SU3 is slightly unhixed to G2 or SO7 with some exotic matters. Secondly, this building block 3 or the exotic atoms can be used to form some of what I think is the most uh, novel discovery in this, this conformal field theory business, uh, namely called conformal matters. Okay? So I'll talk about these things later if I have time. So with these motivations in mind, I want to really understand this self dual string better. Okay? So the strategy is following. I had a failure with the naive ADHM, but I'm going to cure it. I'm going to cure the pathology and make it work. The, the way to make it work is simple. You, you encounter gauge anomaly, so you add lots of matters to cancel the gauge anomaly, and then to see if other basic physics is working well. Okay? So we tried lots of, this is the reason why I really call it bottom-up. It's just like phenomenologists cooking up some models and so on. But, but we have strong constraints coming from string theory. It should give the precisely correct data if you, get the, uh, if, 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 if you successfully get the right model. So it's, it's very easy to test whether you get the right model or not. Uh, as, I, as I'll explain to you slide, uh, a few slides later, uh, there are strong constraints which have been put by the topological ca string calculus of Albrecht about uh, the BPS invariance of these SU3 strings. So if you do slightly wrong with the cure, uh, in, in the process of curing the gauge anomaly, you'll have the wrong matter content and you'll have the wrong BPS spectrum. So this is a really delicate job which requires lots of trials and errors. Yeah. So I, I think at least I spent half a year to have things to work, uh, be on the right track. So the result goes as follows. The result is in a way ugly. So I tried to make a UV uplift to gauge theory, preserving the full 0, 0,4 supersymmetry. That was really impossible. I don't know why, but I tried everything I can. It was impossible. But, look, but note that if you're going to construct UV gauge theory, it's often possible to sacrifice some of the infrared symmetry that you want. Of course, the conformal symmetry is sacrificed in UV. Some of the flavor symmetries could be satisfied, especially supersymmetry. Some of them could be sacrificed as well. Okay? I mean, the supersymmetry enhancement after the algae flow is commonly observed in wide class of theories. So what we can realize is the gauge theory, which is free of all pathologies, by sacrificing some of the 0, 0,4 supersymmetry. Okay? In some ways, uh, it obeys the structure of the 0, 0,4, 0, 0,2 supersymmetric gauge theories in that all the field contents that I add are taking the form of the 0, 0,2 superfields. Okay? So, of course, there are many ways of curing the gauge anomaly caused by the following ADH multiplet, but after some trials and error, we find this complicated addition is doing the job. Okay? Uh, so, the K bar is the antisymmetric representation of UK and antisymmetric of SU3. And T means rank two antisymmetric representation. Symmetric means rank two symmetric representation. So I have some secret working rules on how to decide these ones, but, but, but let me be pr pragmatic because I'm not really sure about the physics of determining these. You just, I just declare that these have to be added. And, 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 and with, with this, I'll pragmatically check that all the physics that we want is reproduced by this quantum field theory. So first of all, by adding this matter, one can immediately check that the UK gauge anomaly cancels to zero. Okay? And secondly, what we want are the following. Since we have added a bunch of matter fields, we should suitably turn on the potentials. More precisely, we should turn on the superpotentials in a suitable way to require the following requirements. We should have, the, first of all, the correct moduli space. Because in the infrared, we know the moduli space of instantons. We don't want the moduli space to have more fields uh, spoiled by these. A related question is that we should turn on a suitable potential so that we have correctly the, the right set of flavor symmetries that we expect on self-dual strings. 
Okay? If you have more flavors, um, chiral multiplet or Fermi multiplet without suitable potential, they can be rotated separately and the flavor symmetry is not what we want. These two kinds of business, again, embarrassingly, cannot be done by turning on the 0,2 superpotential. Basically, there are two kinds of 0,2 superpotential, which people call J and E, but you don't have to know the details here. The only requirement is that the 0,2 superpotentials are holomorphic in the chiral superfields. By requiring chiral holomorphicity, one could never get the correct moduli space. One can never get the correct, chiro, uh, correct flavor symmetries. One has to sacrifice the holomorphicity by going down to this n equal to zero supersymmetry. So some superpotentials are non-holomorphic. They preserve only zero, one supersymmetry, although the field contents are zero, two. But you can correctly get the correct moduli space and the correct flavor symmetry. It seems that you have lots of rooms to do that, but, 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 but it's a it's very, very tight problem of getting the correct things. Uh, I won't even bother you to see this non-holomorphic potential because to most people it will look very ugly. Anyway, after, after some work of turning on the correct potential, I'll explain to you what the results are. So I'll explain to you what kind of moduli space we get in the classical and quantum picture. This is basically kind of consistency check. So, first of all, studying of the classical moduli space is studying the vanishing of the bosonic potential, which is basically the sum of the complete squares of lots of, holomo lots of uh, uh, super potentials in this theory. Okay? So, this potential includes the original ADH engaged, uh, the, the field contents, which were anomalous, and other fields that I have, have added. And requiring this to be zero, I find two branches of moduli spaces. In the first branches, uh, after solving this algebraic equation, I find that all the extra fields that I have put in are required to be zero. Okay? And this first branch, the remaining ADHM fields satisfy the triplet of the following equation, which are nothing but the ADHM condition that has to be satisfied by this field to reproduce the instant of moduli space. Okay? So had there been only this first moduli space, it will be, be a solid proof that the low energy dynamics is seeing the correct moduli space. Okay, so this is a classical analysis. Okay. Since we are studying a UV system with so little amount of supersymmetry, one should, in, in principle, worry about the quantum corrections that can happen to this uh, classical analysis. And all we can do with this, with our technique, is the analysis of the so-called one-loop corrections. And the one-loop corrections are those happening by integrating out the massive fields with these light fields kept. Okay. So the inter integrated, integrated out massive fields carry high masses proportional to some powers of these light fields, which are assuming non-zero values. Okay? So by this kind of integrating out, you can have some one-loop corrections to, in principle to the equations determining the moduli space, but with suitable potentials, super potentials chosen, as I explained in the previous slide, one can show that the one-loop correction in the first branch is vanishing. So at, at, at some quantum order, one has checked the consistency of uh, the robustness of the instant of moduli space against the quantum corrections. Okay? But for the while, quantum corrections in principle should be discussed, but our technology doesn't tell us how to do that. So we are satisfied with doing this one loop consistency checks of the desired moduli space. The fact that we are getting the instant of moduli space at the classical and in some, quant in, in, in some sense quantum level means that the moduli space is going to be hypercalar and it's strong indication that the n equal to 0, 0,4 supersymmetry enhancement will be happening in the infrared, although we started from a very less supersymmetric theory. Another ugly feature is that if you investigate this equation, the vanishing equation carefully, we get an unwanted second branch, classically. Okay? And this second branch meets the original instant on moduli space exactly at single point, uh, let's say for single instant on case. Okay? This is meeting the first desired branch at a small instant on singularity. Okay. So already this somewhat signals that the two branches will be decoupled in the infrared. So the single gauge theory flowing to two decoupled quantum field theory in the IR. But actually what we, what we think we find a much stronger thing. By considering the quantum corrections in the second branch of the same sort, tracing the effect of uh, the integrated out fields in the second branch, one finds that the suitable choice of superpotentials can be made making, giving non-zero one-loop corrections to the first branch equation, making the second branch detached from the first one. 
So although we have done this kind of analysis only at one loop level, we conjecture that this detaching will be happening exactly, uh, which is very ubiquitous, let's say, in 0, 0,2 theories uh, investigated by these authors. And if this detaching happens, it really says that our UV gauge theory will be flowing to two different quantum field theories, where the first branch quantum field theory will be uh, of our interest. Okay? <coughs> so this is a, this, this, yeah, so this is the picture we have about the modular space. And the first branch quantum field theory is the superconformal field theory we want to identify and study. Okay. So we get, in, in a sense, a nonlinear sigma model on the instanton target space. But at the small instanton singularity, it has a curvature singularity. And the sigma model is known to be uh, 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 bad behaved. So it needs a UV completion at this tip. And this UV completion is provided naturally by our gauge theory because all the extra field that we integrated out in the first branch becomes massless only near the tip. So they provide extra degrees of freedom indirectly providing certain UV completion of the sigma model. Okay. So, so now you can do some faithful quantum coil calculations. There are, now we can study other interesting observables. Okay. Very powerful observables that you can study from supersymmetric quantum field theory especially in two dimensions, is called the elliptic genus, which is nothing but the supersymmetric partition function of the quantum field theory on a torus compactified on supersymmetric way. Okay? So in, in quantum field theories, it can be interpreted as some written index counting some BPS states, uh, which carries various charges, including the momentum charge along the compactified circle. So you put all the conserved charge factors in your trace and put all the kinds of fugacities that you can, uh, it's too complicated to remember all, but, but it takes the following form. And once you have a UV gauge theory, as we do now, it's very easy to compute it because these gentlemen have provided with us a very simple contour integral formula to evaluate this elliptic genus. Uh, strictly speaking, they have derived this formula for the 0, 0,2 or 2, 2 theories, but it, but, but it applies straightforwardly to our 0, 0,1 setting by replacing Q, Q bar commutator to Q square. Okay. So following their strategy, for our UK gauge theory for SU3 strings, we can write down the contour integral. It's complicated. You can rewrite it as a specific resid sum, and the resid sum takes the following form. It takes the form of the so-called Young diagram classification. This is a really technical thing, so if you don't want to see it, please ignore this. It's just for the experts. Uh, it's a, this Young diagram classification of this, this kind of written index or elliptic genus races has been quite ubiquitous in this instant on counting problems. So it has been uh, explored, first found by the Italian group and Flume and Pogosian uh, 14 years ago in the context of studying Microsoft partition function. And the same structure happens to appear in our problem. Well, basically because it's, the, it's, an SU, it's a kind of UK gauge theory, the same structure. So we, we, we kind of, this is just to show you that we get a definite closed form expression for the elliptic genus, which has, highly pre pre which has high predictive power. First of all, to make a small non-consistency check, uh, the experts might wonder that the expression is too complicated. Because you know, if you reduce this expression into one dimension, uh, in one dimension it will be providing with you the Witten index for the SU3 instanton particle in five-dimensional SU3 gauge theory. So if you are experts on instant on calculus, you, you'll see that there are too many theta functions in the numerator and so on. Okay? Because the one-dimensional limit of this elliptic genus is obtained by replacing all theta functions by sine functions. And apparently, the expression doesn't look like the SU3 necros of partition function. But by using trigonometric identities in a careful way and so on, you can see that this in the one-dimensional limit agrees with the necros of extra, instant on partition function, which seems to uh, quite surprising to me. We, we, we find various ways of proving this. And in this way, we are founding an ugly but alternative ADHM-like formalisms for SU3 instantons, so, which is ugly, so almost useless in doing this five-dimensional instanton particle counting. But this is the only formalism that successfully uplifts to two-dimensional. Okay? The ordinary SU3 ADHM construction does not. So the one-dimensional consistency check was made. The novel physics can be seen by going up into two dimensions. It looked ugly, but summarizing the answer for k equal to 1, we end up by getting this beautiful formula, okay? where Vs are the chemical potential for the SU3, Ys are the chemical potential for the rotations on R4, and so on. 
uh, epsilon plus uh, is the average of epsilon one and two. And once we have this formula, we can see lots of interesting, uh, um, well, in a way we can test our theory further, yeah, because uh, uh, taking, our, taking our expression at t equal to one, oh, sorry, and expanding it suitably in chemical potentials, you get lots of coefficients given by integers. For instance, if we decide to take the log of partition function and expand it in the angular momentum chemical potentials in the following way, because as Albrecht explained to us uh, earlier, but this takes the form of the genus expansion of topological strings of the associated uh, elliptic calabial. So this G is the genus expansion. The expansion with N is the further refinement. If you restrict the coefficient with 0, 0, this is the usual genus 0 part of the topological string partition function that people consider. And Albrecht and our, our good friends have computed a lot of coefficients appearing in the further expansions of this genus 0 part about two years ago. So this partition function contains really three parameters, two chemical potential for SU3 and one chemical potential for the angular, mo so for the spatial momentum on ellip for elliptic genus. So you expand in three chemical potentials or three charges and you display the numbers. So these are the numbers we get for momentum 0, 1, 2, 3 and the SU3 Cartan charges. The black numbers are what, what Albrecht has thankfully computed to us. It's very non-trivial and crazy numbers. It completely agrees with what we get from our gauge theory. And the red, probably Albrecht can compute, but, but he didn't report it in his paper. And, and it, 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 we can go on forever, just expand this given exact function. And for topological string people, perhaps this should be interesting because we are making, an, we're making a suggestion for the all genus sum and, and closed form expression. So it should be quite interesting to these, uh, the, uh, the topological string theorists. So it, we, we find that our gauge, what's that? <laughs> Actually, the whole motivation of my project, I think one and a half year, was seeing this shocking paper. I, I saw these numbers. I, I was th thrilled, and I, I wanted to reproduce num these numbers from the gauge theory, the only tool I know. And it took one and a half hour to manage it. <laughs> and OK, so having seen these amazing successes, we can do lots of other interesting things. So I kept emphasizing to you that in the recent development of six-dimensional CFTs, the SU3 atomic constituent plays some interesting roles. And I'll try to explain to you just one example that we can study as an application. So once you have this uh, SU3 gauge theory uh, as a building block, you can combine it with what is called the E-string theory to form what is called the E6-E6 conformal matter studied in this paper. The reason why this theory is interesting is because of its M-theory dual realization. So this E6, E6 conformal matter, which in F theory is realized as this kind of geometric setting, in M theory can be realized as follows. So you prepare a single M5 brain, but, uh, but, uh, and you let it to probe the following curve background. So the transverse five-dimensional background is taken to be R, which is this, and it parameterizes tensor branch, times C2 mod E6 singularity. So it's one of the ADE singularities. So if you... Um, if you allow this M5 brains to approach the tip of the singularity, you find a surprising phenomenon that this single M5 brain fractionalizes into four pieces. Okay? And these four pieces can move around separately, enlarging the dimension of the tensor branch. So taking, up, taking away the free tensor multiplet part, you basically have three dimensional tensor branches. And this is the M theory dual realization of this E6, E6 conformal matter. And for E7, E7, E8, E8, a further fascinating fashion of fractionalization has been, uh, has been illustrated uh, by this paper and some follow-up works. So I wanted to study this kind of theory, the cell theory strings of them. And since there are three two-sphere factors, there are three kinds of cell theory string charges, K1, K2, K3. And, and for this one, we can use our SU3 cell theory string gauge theory. For n equal to one cases, we already know the gauge theory for the E strings. So what you have to do is to suitably combine them to form a two-dimensional quiver. Okay? So this part, which I, which, is just, which I just schematically shown because there are so many crazy matters, is to be understood as the, the two-dimensional gauge theory for the SU3 strings. And the remaining part, the dotted parts of the Fermi multiplets, the left side parts are the quiver for the gauge theory for the E strings having E asymmetry, but you partially gauge the E asymmetry with this SU3 to get the remaining E6. And you do the same thing on the other side. 
the characteristic aspects in our UV gaze theory is that not only that it sees less supersymmetries in UV, it sees less global symmetries. So some global symmetries and flavor symmetries can also enhance if you do the algae flow. So in the UV, what we see is a very small amount of symmetry. Instead of seeing E6 times E6, we only see SO10 times SO10 times the diagonal U1 part of U3. So this is, this is not quite the same as E6. Okay? But we find uh, strong signals by stu studying the elliptic genus of this theory that in the infrared, this symmetry is enhancing into E8, E6 times E6 by finding that the numbers, the coefficients, are arranging themselves into E6 times in E6 representations. So this gluing kind of business can be made to form, form a wider class of 0, 0,4 uh, superconformal field theories in two dimensions. One can make further tests for fun. This is very non-trivial test, actually. Because both for SU3 self dual strings and E6, E6 conformal matter strings, once you have a two-dimensional gauge theory, it's immediate exercise to compute the anomalies of the all the flavor symmetries in, the, in your system. Okay? So you go to weekly couple regime and do the standard calculation to compute the anomalies. So these are the anomaly four-form polynomials that one can compute. I wanted to test this anomaly four-form computed from gauge theory, two-dimensional gauge theory, by alternative means. Okay? So, so to do this, we have developed another way of computing the 2D anomalies, 2D flavor symmetry anomalies. And this can be done by recalling to what is uh, the, the invoking what is called the anomaly inflow mechanism. So the anomaly inflow mechanism is basically embedding the lower dimensional system of your interest into higher dimensional string theory or M theory, in which every symmetry is regarded as gauge symmetry. Okay? So in, if everything is gauge symmetry, it has to be canceling exactly. Okay? So for, in this kind of setting, to understand the 2D gauge symmetry, uh, global symmetry anomalies from the higher dimensional gauge symmetry, we recall the anomaly cancellation of the six-dimensional quantum field theory. Okay? Six-dimensional gauge anomaly has to be all canceled for its consistency, but you redo the anomaly cancellation business by inserting a two-dimensional defect. And since you have to insert the two-dimensional defect of self dual strings, at the boundary, there could be extra uncancelled anomaly that can be ha appearing from the bulk calculus. So the extra appearing anomaly is all, is all pre proportional to the four-dimensional delta functions tra transfers to the two-dimensional strings. And we call this the, call this the anomaly for polynomial of the anomaly polynomial. Uh, we, we call the, the resulting violation of the anomaly cancellation as the I inflow, meaning the anomaly polynomial uh, obtained by the, this bulk calculations. So this kind of, anom anom this kind of uh, inflow anomaly is computed because of the presence of this kind of inflow anomaly is basically a bulk anomaly incurred by the presence of the two-dimensional boundary or the defect. So the net anomaly of the system has to be canceled by having the intrinsic two-dimensional anomaly plus the inflow anomaly vanishing. Okay? So by the, this consistency requirement of string theory or higher dimensional system, we require that the intrinsic two-dimensional anomaly plus the inflow anomaly to vanish. So in this way, you can indirectly infer the two-dimensional two, two anomalies. And this can be computed compared with the direct anomaly cancellation of the, of the two-dimensional field theory that we can do with our gauge theories. In both approaches, we get the same anomaly polynomial, which is very, very complicated in E6, E6 conformal matter. But we managed, we managed to check that everything is agreeing perfe perfectly. Okay? So uh, in the remaining time, let me tell you a final application, uh, because my title partly involves exceptional instanton, and uh, nobody will be happy if I say SU3 is exceptional instanton. So I can do real exceptional instanton using our novel approach. Because this can be motivated well by uh, 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 recalling, recalling the 60 Hicksing and unhixings. Okay? So the SU3 theory, I said, can be enriched by combining either a quiver, making either a quiver or adding hypermultiplier matters and enlarging the gauge group. So if you try to unhix the SU3, the only way of unhixing goes as follows. It can be unhixed into G2 by adding one hypermultiplier matter in seven and further into SO7 with two hypermultiplier multiplies in spinner representations and so on. So for these sequences, we were able to generalize our SU3 instanton strings quiver to the G2 and SO7 instanton quiver. 
coupled to some number of spinner matters. And both cases are the, the, the ones in which one had no traditional ADHM-like descriptions. G2 by itself is an exceptional gauge theory. And SO7 has its own ADHM description. But in this description, one doesn't know how to incorporate the matters in spinner representation. So both cases can be regarded as e exceptional settings in some sense. And in our novel formalism, we can, we can manage to find the gauge theory description for these uh, uh, instanton strings and also instantons and do some non-trivial calculations. To illustrate how things are happening, the, again, the key idea is the sacrifice of the infrared symmetry in the UV gauge theory. So SO7 instanton, let us consider this. SO7 is a classical gauge group. We think we know the ADHM construction perfectly well. Of course, that's true. But it has some limitation of not allowing some matter, con matter inclusions and so on. So what we find is an alternative ADHM real uh, construction of SO7 instantons in which only an SU4 subgroup of SO7 is manifest. So this is again going to be some uh, ugly thing in some sense, just like our SU3 alternative ADHM was ugly. But, but, but our gauge theory is making this SU4 manifest only, and it will have some merit for this for paying this price. So the gauge theory construction we make is the following. So since it has an SU4, so SU4 instanton is part of SO7 instanton, so it should contain SU, SU4 ADHM data as, part, as, as a part of its field. And then we add lots of other fields. Uh, we have some secret rules, but at this stage, let me say we determined it empirically. Just like we determined the right gauge theory for the SU3 strings, we can add lots of fields to make it make it give the right physics of SO7 instantons. Okay? So the field that we have to add turns out to be this one. Okay? This is a terribly ugly one because it doesn't even see the SO7 in UV. It's claimed to appear only after infrared symmetry enhancement, which you check by instanton partition function. But the merit of this approach is that now we can include the effect of uh, the hypermatter multiplex in spinner representation. Okay? Because spinner representation in SU4 language just decomposes into 4 plus 4 bar. And it's immediately clear how to in include the matter contents corresponding to the hypermultiplets in fundamental representation. It's just including some numbers of Fermi multiplets. So this is the new, ugly, alternative SO7, SO7 instanton uh, world volume gauge theory having some, uh, having some inclusion of matters. And once you have this, if this is correct, you can suitably hix it to form the G2 ADHM formalism. And then if you further exit, you get back to our SU3 gauge theory I explained to you. Now this is, looks ugly, but it's very useful. For instance, you can compute the G2 and the SO7 instanton partition function. It perfectly works well. Without any matters, you compute the partition function of our ugly SO7 ADHM. It agrees with the known necrosov partition function and so on. Now you hix it to G2. You, you, can, you can have a new contour integral formula for, let's say, in one dimension the written index for the one written index for some number of G2 instanton particles, and it completely agrees with the G2 instanton partition function computed by various indirect methods. For instance, uh, Amihai and uh, Nopado and collaborators have computed the G2 instanton partition functions in various different ways. Oh, actually, Sergio has involved in the one instanton calculus as well some time ago. And the main technique they have advocated to calculate the exceptional instanton partition function is using some three-dimensional mirror symmetry and doing some monopole instanton calculus and trying to reproduce the Hilbert series of the Higgs branch and so on. So it's done by very indirect ways. But we can see that the gauge theory that I written, wrote to you in the previous slide give right to the written index, which completely agrees with the known results. And here the merit is that you can again include the matters of G2 instantons. So in some sense, we are getting the ADHM-like quantum mechanics description for G2 instantons and also for G2 instanton strings and SO instanton strings. Okay? So once we know this kind of thing, we have the self theory string gauge theory for, this, for this, ex, this exotic atoms, which include G2 or SO7 with spinner matters and so on. So we can do some nice things. So these are all works in progress with these, my collaborators. So let me finish. Uh, I tried to explain to you that we are getting some uh, solid uh, progress concerning the studies of self theory strings. But it's admittedly very difficult to study six-dimensional conformal field theories. Even after we 
reduce our interest to a very, very small subset of two-dimensional self-dual strings, we encounter lots of unexpected difficulties having to do with exceptional instantons and so on. But we think we are gradually overcoming some of the difficulties, finding surprising new discoveries concerning some gauge theory-like description for exceptional instantons and so on. It will be very interesting to see if our basic idea can be applied to other exceptional gauge theories. We are trying this, but it's very hard to say at this moment whether we are getting complete success or not. Again, the basic idea, just like the SO7, is that some of the UV, complete, UV flavor symmetries can be reduced compared to the infrared symmetry that your one wishes. So for instance, if you consider G2, E7, E8, there are natural SUN type subgroup uh, which preserves maximal rank, uh, which we aim to preserve in the UV theory, but uh, hoping that the gauge theory will enhance to this, uh, this enhance the exceptional flavor symmetry. The G2 case has been already checked. I mean, I explained to you in the previous slide. E7 and E8 and maybe E6 and E4, these are challenges left to us. Okay? And finally, uh, our two-dimensional quantum field theories, since it's the D3 brain and seven brains wrapping the two sphere, is closely related to the four-dimensional Argyris Douglas theories that has been explained to us by Casanova some days ago. Because these Argyris Douglas theories are precisely obtained by letting a D3 brain to probe a set of non-trivial seven brain singularity. So if you compactify this, exactly that system into two, on the two sphere, we get our self dual string system. So it will be interesting to see if the two approaches have some interesting lessons to each other. Okay, so I'll close here. I'll stop here. Thank you.